Well, Brett, good morning to you, and welcome to Plants, Pests, and Pathogens for first of our 2015 series. Um, glad that you're with us this morning. We've got some exciting new things to show you and, and to do. I want to be sure that you help us keep track of who all is participating by taking a minute to type into the chat box your name and your county and the number of people at your site. Um, be sure you run an audio setup wizard. We're going to have lots of opportunities to interact today, and we want to be sure your mic is on and working so we can hear your input. Let's see. Um, except when you're actually talking or asking a question, if you leave your microphone off, that will keep us from getting any feedback noise. Uh, we always record the sessions, and that will be available online. And those agents who want to get continuing education credit for the event, please register for LMS. That's the event ID for you. OK, I'm Lucy Bradley. I'm, I'm the Urban Horticulture Specialist at NC State and the State EMG Coordinator, and delighted to be working with you this morning. Lee J. Temple is our instructional technologist. Welcome, Lee J. Yay, good morning, everyone. I'm Lee J. Um, I'll be giving you a short walkthrough of Collaborate. Um, on the left-hand side at the very top is your talk button. If you're um, asking a question, you can click on that, and that will allow all of us to hear it. Um, if you're not asking a question, as Lucy said, make sure that that is not clicked. Um, underneath, there is our participant area. Um, it lists all the folks that are joining us today. We've got a great group. Um, underneath, we have the chat room. Um, you can type in the chat box, and you can ask a question to the moderators uh, or to the person speaking, and we'll get back to you. Um, <clears throat> to the right is the uh, whiteboard, and um, that is where your content will be displayed. So if you have any questions, just uh, let me know in the chat box. Um, this morning, I'd like to know where you're coming from. So if you click um, on the whiteboard, there's a little icon that looks like a sun. If you click on that, you can click in the map Yep, and let us know where you're coming from. Okay, take another minute because we've got a lot more people on the line than we have clicked on the map. So I'd love to have a record of, of how much of the state we're serving with this program. So please go ahead and take a minute and, and click your, your county. All right, thanks. This year we're going to try something different. We're going to do focus more on interactive opportunities, and one of the ways we're going to do that is, is by breaking us up into smaller groups. At, at certain points during the um, session, we're going to split out into uh, these separate breakout groups to do diagnostic exercises. And, and um, when you're in those breakout groups, what we'll want to do is to select a spokesperson. Uh, ideally, we'll select someone who has access to a microphone so that they can be a part of reporting back to the group what goes on. We're going to give you a, a scenario for you to diagnose what the plant problem is. And so your challenge is to identify what's wrong with the plant, identify what additional information you would need to be able to tell what's wrong with the plant, identify what type of sample you would need to submit to get information, and if you can rule out other, other problems, let us know that. Then we'll come back together. With, um, and um, go through the process as, as a whole team. The breakout will happen automatically. You don't have to decide which room you're going to go to. We will automatically split the group evenly into four groups. So um, there will be three breakout rooms plus the group that will meet in the main room. Those of you who meet, end up meeting in the main room will be bounced to a breakout room and then be bounced back to the main room. We, we have to be, have a group in the main room because we're going to record that. Um, section in the, in the recording will, will be of the, the group that's in the main room. Anybody have any questions about the, the breakouts and how that will work? Okay. Uh, the other thing that we're going to do this year is focus on diagnostic skills. We're going to um, provide seasonal information ab uh, about you know, what's happening this time of year. We're going to have a demonstration of diagnostic skills. We'll break out into rooms for everyone to participate in that diagnostic process. And we're going to report back. 
and, and have a summary of the diagnostic process and then move on to, um, you know, IPM strategies for managing those problems. So that's our plan. Spring. You know, days are getting longer, days are getting warmer, but not consistently. So we have big, big dips and warm temperatures and then cold temperatures again. So there's a lot of inconsistency. Steps beginning to flow in the, in the trees. Our early bloomers are starting to blossom. Got crocus in the, in the picture, but canalias and maples and others are, are already up and going. Insect activity is slow, but starting. And, and by the end of, of this month, it should really be cranking up. Today's program, we're going to focus on woody ornamentals. Every program will have a different specific focus. So we're going to fo we'll focus on vegetables at another time. We'll focus on um, herbaceous perennials at a different time. But today is all about woody ornamentals. So I'm going to turn it over to Mike to talk about woody ornamentals. Good morning, everybody. Let me get a green check, please, from everybody who can hear my voice, and I would say our red X if you can't hear me, but that that joke is getting old. <laughs> All right, yes, a it lot is. Of text, but not everybody. Yeah, there's some okay. here. I wonder if it's because they're not finding the check. If you're looking for it, looks like people are still finding it because the number is continuing to increase. Underneath your name on the, should be by default on the left-hand panel, there's a set of four icons there, the fourth of which is where you select whether you check yes or no with a green check for yes and a red X for no. And it looks like 32 people have found it, although there are a few still who have not. Well, in the room, you guys will move a lot faster and get to focus on interesting things, if you hop to when he asks you to check, check the box, and then we can move on. We don't have to keep saying, pretty please check, OK? In this case, we're giving you a little extra time because we want to make sure that the interactive portions are going to work when we get to that point. You'll see quite a few. Out of 55, only 34 checks. So. What do you want to do, Lucy? Should we uh, ask the people who are struggling maybe to call that uh, that line for help, the collaborate line that's not any one of us? Right. Yeah, or, or if one of you guys who hasn't checked, if you can put us a note in the chat box that lets us know what the challenge is so we can help you figure that out. We really want this to be interactive. And for, for that to work, we need people to, have, to be able to use the tools to to make it happen. So, all right. So we'll let folks resolve those, and I'll and I'll go ahead and move on. The first portions here, we're going to walk you through three different scenarios. Take you by the hand and talk a little bit about a diagnostic process. A couple cases fairly simple. One case a little bit more complicated. Both Matt and I will do this, and then as Lucy already mentioned. We'll each let you have your hand at it in what we're going to call our breakout rooms. So for the first example of a walkthrough, things are a little behind this year. So I was able to use the example that was planned for February, even in March, because the camellias bloomed late. Here is where, let's say you've got a homeowner with a camellia japonica, spring blooming, that in the early spring is having a problem. You can see that some of the blooms look quite good. Foliage looks healthy. But some of the blooms are turning brown and dropping to the ground. Again, as we look at this, we note that there don't seem to be any symptoms on the foliage itself, no wilting or leaf curling or blotching. It just appears that the blossoms are affected. And one of the questions we would ask in this case is whether or not there had been a recent frost that would possibly have provoked this, although you would wonder why only certain blossoms were affected. So let's say that no, the frosts were a couple of weeks ago now, and so there would be no immediate reason to suspect that, plus the fact that scattered blossoms are affected. What you would do in this case 
is you would take one of those fallen or still hanging dead blossoms and pull off the portion, the, the receptacle, that very base of the that base of the blossom separating the petals from it. And if you look closely, you can see sort of a fringe of white right there at the very base of the petals. And if we look at it even more closely, on a different blossom, we can see very clearly that that fringe of white isn't a normal plant part. This is actually fungal mycelium, we call it, indicating the presence of the organism that caused the blossoms to blight. And this is a pretty straightforward diagnosis when you have a disease called camellia petal blight. The fungus is called Siberemia camelliae. And it's interesting because this year I went and looked at a shrub that's always very reliable for being able to give us this disease to show, and I didn't find any. And I'm wondering, this is just my idea now, I'm no proof here to back this up, but that the extremely cold winter messed up the timing because there's a very precise timing between when the fungus emerges in the spring, very inconspicuous cup-like fruiting bodies that come out of the, uh, basically out of the soil where the fungus has been overwintering in the, the hard, what are called sclerotia that formed from the blossoms. Those pop out about the same time as the flowers are blooming and this allows the fungus to infect. We may come back and mention this in a little bit in some of the IPM practices, what we would do about this. The point we want to get across right now, though, is that it's a fairly, in this case, straightforward process to step-by-step step look for where the problem is occurring on the plant, what the timing was, and then, in this case, to know the trick of pulling off the base of the flower to look for the fungus. The second case I want to walk you through is a little bit more complicated. Now let me just mention that a uh, little disclaimer that not all of these pictures are from the same situation, but I pulled them together to illustrate points that, uh, that I want to get across here. This picture that you're seeing now is actually from a field nursery that was submitted in November of 2013, but the case that we're talking about here could happen really any time of year. Now, gone are the halcyon days. I remember when I first started working in the clinic and boxwood foliage pretty much automatically went into the trash because there was nothing interesting ever to diagnose on it. We always had problems only with the basically the roots and maybe lower stems. Now, life is a little bit more complicated because um, we've got some diseases on the stems and on the foliage that we have to worry about. Now, of course, we always did have to keep an eye out for things like boxwood leaf miners or mites. But in this particular case, we don't see any evidence of those, and we don't see any leaf spots. There's leaves that are wilted, drying up, but there are no actual spots there except for this one here. But that is not something that we're going to consider significant. The other thing that you want to notice here is that there's no defoliation. The leaves are drying up, but they're hanging onto the stems. They're not falling off. So those two facts, the fact that there are no spots and that the leaves are holding on, allow us to rest easy, breathe a little sigh of relief that we're not looking at a case of boxwood blight. The wilting part, though, makes us wonder about the possibility of root rot. And the yellowing of the foliage makes us wonder either about root rot or the possibility of boxwood stem canker. Let's look at the stems then. Obviously, in this case, some time ago, the cambium and the bark were destroyed on portions of these stems, on sections of them. And even if we were to cut away here at the portion that's not affected, um, 
we would notice that there is really no significant discoloration of that wood. It's it's fairly white as boxwood wood should be. So when we see that there's no discoloration of the wood, we say we don't have a canker disease. Here's another situation or uh, another look at the same sort of symptom. You can see that the wood is exposed, but in fact the bark is trying to heal over. And what this is, this is classic for cold injury. In the early stages, it would be the bark splitting and loosening from the wood. And later stages, you might see this sort of exposed wood. Now remember, cold injury, this is, this is one of my uh, lasting memories from first starting to work in the clinic back in the late 90s, where we were diagnosing cold injury in August or July. And I was wondering, what is going on? was because the injury occurred back when either the plant was just going into dormancy or starting to come out of dormancy. And the first part that goes, I'm sorry, the last part that goes dormant is the base of the main stem. So you get hit by a late freeze, I'm sorry, an early freeze before the plant is completely dormant and that's when you get the damage. But when you start seeing symptoms on the shrub as a whole, may not be until you've got stress occurring during the heat and dry periods of the summer. We're not done though. Always, always look at the roots. And in this case, we can see that the roots look brown. Boxwood roots should be a lighter color. Notice that some plants have dark roots just naturally. Many woody plants will have somewhat dark roots and also ferns classically have black roots, are practically black, so you have to know your healthy plant. But in this case, these roots do not look good. And if we did the root rot, root sloughing test, we would notice that the exterior portion of that root can be easily pulled off. The vascular bundle here in the middle, so you could take this portion here and slide it back and forth on that tough vascular tissue. So we know that this is some kind of a root rot that we're looking at. That's the, that's the best test you can do. Our conclusion in this case with the, uh, the plant here is that we know we don't have boxwood blight. We know we don't have boxwood stem canker. We do know we have cold damage and that there's some kind of root rot, which could be a fungal root rot, or we may have a nematode problem. So the conclusion here is that you would want to submit a sample to the clinic to confirm those things. As it turned out, the sample that's pictured here had both Phytophthora root rot as well as spiral nematodes. So that's our case two walkthrough, and I will turn it over to Matt for our walkthrough on case three. Thanks, Mike. Um, there's actually a question in the, uh, this is just a diagnosis. There was a question in the chat. I don't know if you want to address that or if we want to just move on to diagnosis. I think we're just going to move on to diagnosis. I'm sorry, okay. I had my microphone off. Yes, we're going, to, yeah. we're going to talk about the IPM practices for woody ornamentals after we go through the walkthrough scenarios, and I'll make sure that I mention camellia petal blight during that part of the part of the show. Okay. All right. Well, walkthrough diagnosis case three. So the host here is wisteria, whether you like it or not, um, and. Uh, as far as the season, this was actually taken, this photo was actually taken the previous year, um, and uh, there were no symptoms noticed. Um, and uh, that was until the spring, when there were no leaves on the plants. The, the, uh, and uh, basically what they saw was all these things covering the entire growth of the plant uh, from stems two inches and smaller. Now they had an infection of beetles last spring that they, they said, 
uh, black, much like ladybugs, uh, but for only a couple of days and then they're gone. And then this year also the buds actually are beginning to come out, so we're assuming then the general health of the tree is pretty good. Um, it's not showing any uh, delayed bud out, um, anything like that. So um, basically we're go what we're going to do is we're going to have to look a lot closer. So we look at this tree and it's got all this, this very odd texture for a wisteria. Um, and if uh, we look a little closer again, we see all these little kind of bumps all over it. And so, uh, what do we do? Is it a disease? Uh, is it an insect or arthropod? Or is it something else? Because we've got to consider certain other situations, like the cold injury, the abiotic symptoms that are not caused by an organism, but by environmental conditions. Uh, so what we we'll go do? First, we'll inspect the growths. So are they detachable? What is their shape and color? Uh, what's inside them? You might want to go and cut them in half and see what's inside. Uh, and where are they located or localized? Uh, so there, there are several possible situations where you have multiple growths on a plant. So uh, in situation A right here, this is a rose, and you can see these small little dots all over the place. This is all associated with a canker, uh, and this will be fungal fruiting bodies, either of a pathogen or if the branch is dying or dead, you may have secondary fungi coming in and growing there. Uh, you can also, if your plant is in the shade, um, you can actually have uh, fungal fruiting bodies, both lichens and both. Um, lichens and other ones here, creating this odd texture on the plant. Uh, one of the uh, ones that looks suspicious but actually is perfectly normal are the lenticels, or these little small bumps. Uh, either sometimes they're long ridges or these small bumps on the trees. And those are perfectly normal. That's uh, how the tree exchanges gas through its trunk. Uh, so they're kind of soft and spongy. And lastly, it could be something like an insect pest, like scale insects or some other sedentary uh, small pest. So uh, what do we have here? Well, if you were to take one of these and clip it over, you'd see that uh, there's something odd underneath. Uh, and it's not doesn't look like plant tissue. It looks like uh, probably some kind of insect pest. Um, and here we see, when you flip it over, those are actually eggs, but you would also find uh, soft-bodied insects there. So uh, in that case, then, what we're looking at is some sort of bug, and it's sedentary. There are no discernible body parts. There are many all over the plant. So that leads us to uh, identify it as a scale. But then in order to get the best type of control or the best kind of information about this type of pest, you've got to figure out which type of scale it is. Uh, different types require different types of control. And so what we're going to do is look at the two most common groups. So it's either going to be a soft scale, uh, coxid uh, over here, or a diaspidid scale, uh, an armored scale. So the two main differences you're looking for here are, is it large and globular? And if you pull the top off, does is it just take the entire insect off? Or are they small and flat, um, shell-like? And you can basically pull the cover off, and you'll have an insect under there. Uh, so based on what we would observe, uh, hopefully in the field, you would uh, take that. You know, there are so many on the tree. You can you can do what you will. Uh, with any of them, and basically pick apart the, these these tiny insects and see that in fact the the top does come off. And although this is not the actual scale that you would see on that tree, that was actually the Japanese maple scale. Uh, armored scales are going to have these covers that give them a little bit of protection and uh, kind of uh, obscure the body. But when you pull the cover off, you will see a nice soft-bodied insect under there. Uh, and that's how you know it's an armored scale rather than a soft scale. Awesome photographs. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, so uh, that is it for uh, the walkthrough diagnosis case three.
Uh, and now, uh, I guess, it's time for us to try, uh, have everybody try their own hand at uh, looking through some photos uh, and uh, asking questions and trying to figure out a situation. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to create some breakout rooms. Um, as a participant, what's going to happen is you're going to be put into a room with just a few people. Um, you'll have a, a white screen for a moment, and then I'll load um, some content, and one of our expert moderators will be in there to walk you through your scenario. So just hang tight um, for about 60 seconds. All right. Those of us who are left here in the main room are going to work together. I can't see a count here of just who's in the main room anymore because it includes the breakouts. But let me ask for a green check again for those of you who can hear my voice. And we'll also see if the only the people in the main room here can hear it. All right, that looks good. Let's see. We have a hand raised here. At least I. Yes, Georgiana. We were just. We don't know what we're doing. Okay. <laughs> okay, that's that's fair for the the first time. Did you? You found the hand raising. Oh, we know good. how to raise our hand and to talk. Were we supposed to go to a session, or are they going to just take us there? Well, you have already been taken there. Okay, that's all we want to you know. Even, We're here. <laughs> you, you, you didn't even I feel didn't it. I didn't even feel it. That's wrong. I'm just, I'm just. Okay. Well, just by the fact that you are able to use your microphone and have volunteered, we're going to consider you to be the reporter for the group once we go back to the main oh, room. And to talk about, we talk about the, well, we are in the main room, but when everyone comes back together, it'll be you and your group's responsibility to do the, the summary of what Thank we Thank you for that grand opportunity. So what I'm going to do, you, you are most welcome. The, uh, let's see, we've popped to, this is not the page we were supposed to be on, I don't believe. Can you still hear me? All right, let me, uh, let me ask for that green check again. Okay, good. Somehow we went to a page that I was not expecting, and so I'm going to go back to where we need to be here. And what I'm going to do is start out with this photograph and pretend that I am the homeowner who's come to your office to ask you about this problem. Now here you're going to be able to ask me any questions that you want regarding the situation and also you can ask to see different parts of the plant. I have some other photographs but I'm not going to show them unless you ask me specifically about these things. So you can use the chat box, those of you who don't have a microphone, those of you who do have a microphone and want to do it that way, can raise your hand and then I will call on you in order. So the starting scenario here is simply that the homeowner comes with this particular shrub, it is an azalea, and they notice that some of it is dying back like this. 
And I, the homeowner, am asking you, what is happening here? All right, let's see. You can go ahead and type in the chat box, too, if you want to participate that way. Meanwhile, I, I heard a hand go up, but I don't see who it was. I see Debbie is typing. There is no picture. We can't okay. see anything. You cannot see it. All right. Uh, can you see it now? Yes. All right. Thank you for bringing that to my attention. So, homeowner says, my azalea is dying back. What is your first question, your first response? How are you going to take this? Again, I heard a, a hand go up, but I didn't see anything. And I don't Mike, that means that a hand went up, and it can be in any room, and only the uh, moderators hear that. Okay, thanks, PJ. So, what would you say, those of you here in the main room, what would you say to me as a homeowner when I come in with this problem? What would you ask? We would ask if was dying back in several places or only in one spot. All right. And I would say that this is um, this is just the um, on this one shrub and it's scattered branches on the shrub. What would your next question be? Again, you can use the the chat box down below to. Oh, wait a second. Here we go. I see why I wasn't following here because the I have my chat box scrolled up. So when did you notice the problem? Well, the shrub bloomed nicely last spring, and then in the summer the branches started dying. And uh, Deborah Evans says that she needs a close up, so I'll go ahead and provide a close up of the of the shrub here. Okay. Now, did that? Uh, did that give me a green check if the picture changed to a close up? Give me a red X if the picture did not change to a close up. All right, we've got a problem here. There it changed. Okay. So there is a branch broken. No, the branches aren't broken, but there was some pruning that had been done before. It was getting tall and it was pruned back some. I don't remember exactly when. But here, since you asked, let me show you what the cross section of the branches looked like where they were cut off. And the other question was, are there others around that look the same. No, this is going to be the only real, uh, actually this is the only azalea here in the landscape. And all the hollies in the box would look fine. All 
Right. Do you have any other branches to compare what the healthier branches, there might be something happening on the other branches? Uh, well, some of the branches look just fine. They would look like this, this white wood with the uh, green cambium all the way, all the way through. Uh, is it coal damage? Um, I, uh, that's, um, how would I know? What would, what would let me know if I've got coal damage or not? I'll ask, I'll ask Deborah that question while I answer Benjamin, Benjamin, Seth, Rose, and Brandon. Uh, do the roots or soil smell funny? Well, no, they smell, they smell like, you know, soil, soily kind of smell. I can show a picture, though, a close-up of, of those roots. Here's what they, they look like when we take a close look. Did they cut it back too late? Um, um, what would too late be? I, I would say we cut it back, uh, it was getting kind of tall, we cut it back in, um, it's in the summer sometime. Is that is that too late? Is there standing water? No, no, no standing water um, in the in this area. What do normal roots look like? Um, well, I'll. I'll I'm not sure. I would have to kind of go and dig some up from another azalea, but since I don't have one, I've only got the other kinds of shrubs. I'm really not. I'm really not sure. Here, here, obviously, I'm trying to play the role of the of the gardener. Oops. Where's the branch? Now we've got roots. So suddenly we are all in the same room again, it appears. Is that correct? It, yes, it, it looks that way. It was not my doing. Well, we had just about tapped out our ideas in the main room, so we'll just go ahead and continue with the, the review of what we were what we were looking at here. Um, let's see where is the Breakout. What page is the main room? Because I'm I don't know where the main room is. I'm seeing a whole bunch of different pictures. Right now, you should be just seeing a tangle of roots. If you're seeing a lot of pictures overlapping each other, like the program got messed up somehow, try minimizing the window and then maximizing it again. Don't close it up. Mike, just hit the little minus sign that minimize it. Mm-hmm. Mike, yes. can you hear me? Um, I don't know. If, has my room yes, come back? Has my room come back to the main room? Yeah, everyone's back in the main room, and you can okay. tell um, in the participant list it says main room, and then it lists all the names. Okay, in my room, and I don't know if it was something I was doing wrong or what, but we could not. We were having only intermittent where they could see the images. Hmm. What was happening? I don't know. Maybe it was diagnosing the problem because we couldn't see the pictures. My problem was that my follow check kept getting popped off. Yeah. And so I had to keep going back to that, and then the group would come into the slide where I was. Okay. Yeah. So I had the same thing where I I had it on, but for them to see a picture, I had to click it on and then click it off. You know, I had to toggle it, in other words, to get it for, right. where they could see the images. We could also hear what was going on in other rooms, and I hadn't expected that. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Well, that's interesting. That's not like it was in the rehearsal. No. <laughs> no. 
You guys well, are all learning with us as we as we yes. try out this new process. <laughs> so we're back in the main room with you, Mike. All right, welcome back. Um, yeah, we didn't we didn't get very far in ours. Um, we were trying to work out some uh, microphone and and uh, chatting things and uh, just trying to get the uh, questions line up with the with the photos or vice versa. Right. And one other problem I had was uh, partly I think I had scrolled up, but also I noticed that I wasn't seeing anyone's chats, but they were down there at the bottom where I was. In fact, mm -hmm. I um, well, yeah, I see. I'm sorry, uh, Durham, Betty, Jordan, uh, you weren't supposed to see a follow-up button. That comment was for the that was for the moderators to make sure that everyone in their groups could see the images that they wanted to see. Um, I see there was a question, did you have a bad winter and not salt your walkways? Uh, no, nothing like that happened either. But let's let's go ahead and do the recap of, I'm not sure if there's much to be said if the groups were having technical difficulties, but I'm going to go ahead and ask the group that was in the main room with me to kind of talk about what we talked about. And uh, so let's have a little discussion here. And I had already designated, oh, now I can't find you because, uh, Georgianne? Yes. Is our designated from uh, Durham County, is our designated Please. reporter for the process that we went through. So if you could just kind of summarize for folks briefly what it was, that the questions that you asked and the answers you got and what was, because I could hear your questions and read them, but I couldn't hear the thought process behind that. So what were you thinking when you were asking and, and commenting? Do you want me to talk or do you want me to write? Talk, please, since you do have a microphone. Oh, okay. Um, several questions were asked when um, he first showed the picture of the die-off on the azaleas. There were several limbs, not just one, am I correct? Yes, several limbs on this one shrub. And questions were, was there winter damage? Um, we wanted a close-up of the limbs. We also wanted to know if it had been pruned recently, and it had, but not that was not the cause. We, we never did really find out the cause. Um, someone asked, was there salt added to the um, sidewalks because of a bad winter? And we had, um, no one asked about animals, but we did see that the roots appeared to be healthy. Someone asked, were there bugs around the roots? Uh, was there standing water? Um, those were some of the questions that were asked about this particular issue. Is that enough? And so we never really oh. did, we never did get to a conclusion. Mm -mm. Let me, let me just mention, uh, unless, is there another group that wanted to comment on anything that they, they said that might not have been mentioned here? Well, one thing that was, that was, uh, that you drew our attention to was the fact that these are the limbs that were pruned and obviously there's evidence of some diff different coloration inside the limb structure. Right, that, absolutely. That, that's going to be a key clue here in this case. And the other group have a comment on something that they brought up that didn't come up here just now? I asked how old it was. I, I don't believe you saw that. Yes, that's an excellent question. We we always want to ask that question, and the uh, answer that we agreed on for the purposes of this exercise was to say that the shrub was there when we moved in seven years ago, so I'm not sure. And that's key because very often that first year after transplanting, it's something that's not really related to disease or insects. It has to do with the way it was transplanted or stresses or the time of transplanting or the condition of the plant when it went in rather than anything that uh, came in in terms of a pest or pathogen. Any other comments? Mike, we had asked if anything had been done to the plant or around the plant and we're told that um, 
No, that just the mulching had been done, but that was about it. Okay, another excellent question. Yes, and our group would have, I was just about to show them these pictures uh, right here of the branches. So somebody asked about looking closer. The first question was looking at the base for cold injury or anything like that that could have affected physical injury. The second question, and then it led to, let's look a little closer to where these uh, branches are dying. So and here, our group asked about other plants, what other types of plants were affected. Were there other azaleas affected? Were there other types of plants affected? And the answer was? This is the only azalea in the landscape, um, and but no other types of plants were affected. The hollies and boxwoods and other things were fine. Okay, good. So at least among among all the groups, people were asking all the relevant questions, or at least most of them. One of the things that no one pointed out in our group, I don't know if they did in another one, when they saw the close-up, and they did ask for a close-up, you'll notice that the branch here that's completely dead, if you trace it back, you'll notice it gets down to a point from which perfectly healthy green foliage is emerging. And that is an important clue that we don't have a root problem. Now, we'll see in a second what we would do about that, but that leads you to want to examine the bark under, or examine under the bark here in this portion where we would, might find a transition zone between what's dead and what's healthy. And this is an illustration of that kind of transition zone, not actually from this shrub, where cutting away the bark we can see how the cambium is dead and there's a very sharp line between the dead tissue and the healthy green tissue, which in cross-section happens to look, in this case, like a nice wedge of pie of wood that has died. And when we see this, we know that we're dealing with some kind of a canker disease, that sharp transition between healthy wood or cambium and dead. The roots. Um, this was a case, I picked a, a root picture that wasn't actually azalea, and I did this because I was looking for a photograph of roots that were iffy. It's not as clearly decayed as the roots that we showed in the example from the boxwood walkthrough, but yet they're not, the sign roots are not a nice healthy cream or white color. There seems to be some decay in there. And the conclusion that you would want to reach in this case was, first of all, that you had a canker disease. And notice that the earlier pruning could have been the wounding sites that that canker fungus got in, but that you have at least some suspicious looking roots that you would want to send into the clinic along with some soil. So this is a case where you may not be able to get to a final conclusion based on your conversation with the client and that a sample is going to be necessary, although you should be able to reach the conclusion that you do have a canker disease. Now, I heard that Matt's group asked about the base of the plant, and they should have been shown then this photograph, taken obviously after the snow, showing multiple stems coming from the, from the base, but not really anything remarkable in terms of any bark peeling, splitting, any obvious decay. The picture that no one saw, because it wasn't included in that set, was a little bit backed out from that, where you can see that there was actually one of these stems that had died earlier and, and was cut off. So this, these canker diseases, our usual strategy is to just prune them out. Go a good at least six inches into healthy wood, Always to a bud, you know, follow your good printing practices, sanitize your shears between cuts or as frequently as you can. But be aware that there are going to be cases where the canker might reach, as in this picture here, a different shrub, but the canker could reach the base. And of course, then the prognosis for this particular shrub is not good. Just to take the mystery out of it a little bit, I have been able to find the fungus Fomopsis on that azalea and presume that that is the cause. It is a canker fungus. Often these are 
opportunistic, so trees that are under stress, shrubs that are under stress, tend to get these canker diseases. And of course, any kind of injury or wounding is a good entrance. We don't know a chicken or egg here. We don't know if it was the pruning that allowed the fungus to get in or if what was pruned out was the, the, the branches that had previously died from a canker. So does anybody have a, a comment, observation, or question about our first breakout, our first ever breakout <laughs> diagnostic exercise? Uh, okay, once again, I wasn't seeing what was happening down below this in the chat box. Are these bushes close to your driveways or walkways? Might have been too much salt from the ice. Okay, we ruled that one out. It was actually, we're going to say it was next to the foundation next to a building. How old? We talked about that. Have we ruled out fungal disease? No, we do believe it's a fungal canker disease, actually. Any type of spraying for weeds, et cetera? No, it was only mulch that was done. So I think we covered that pretty well. In which case... We have a raised hand. I think, so, yeah, I think Jen's oh, got hand up. I am sorry. Yes. So what do you do about this problem? Well, again, you would send in a sample if there's any kind of doubt as to the health of the root system. So step one is send in a sample, including some of those transition zones between the healthy and dead tissue. I'll go back to this picture here. So this branch, for example, would be a good one to send in. Cutting down here, cutting up here so we can see that transition zone, maybe some branches like this, not things that are completely dead nor completely healthy, and the roots and soil so that we could get a a good diagnosis on it. But in the case of a canker disease, the two strategies are optimize all of your horticultural practices, so the fertilization, watering, etc., so that you do not have stress on the shrub, and then pruning of the limbs that are dying back, going down well into the clean wood. So that would be, in a summary, what we would do for canker diseases, and we don't spray for those, by the way. Some either less knowledgeable or unscrupulous grounds people might try and sell you on a spray program for canker diseases, but that is not what we recommend. Anything else? All right. We are going to break it out again, and I'll let Lucy and Lee Jay talk about how it's going to work this time. Well, it's going to work more, more smoothly this time because we, we had our experience with, with the first one. Um, Lee Jay's going to pop us all into separate rooms and then, then with, go through the same diagnostic process, and then we'll come back together to talk about it. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Yeah, there's almost 70 of us, so it takes a minute for Lita to pop us all out into the different rooms. But when you get there, you'll have a, a different scenario. So, We'll have, again, a, a variety of images that we can show you in response to questions that you ask about the plant. And again, we're interested in the diagnostic process and how you, how you approach coming to a, an answer. So Lee Jay, are you popping us into rooms? Yeah, Mike, you have all of your participants um, back in the main room that you're going to have, and the other folks are in their separate rooms. So hopefully this will go a little more smoothly this time. Um, so I thought Matt was going to stay in the main room this time. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, I'll switch you back out. <laughs> OK, 
Okay, Matt, you are now in the main room with your group of folks, and um, the others are doing their thing in their own separate rooms. Okay, same group I was in before? Uh, no. They, I mean, they brought me back. You brought me back from that room because uh, I was just talking to them. Uh, but okay, well, we'll start again. <laughs> okay, sorry. Okay. No problem. Okay. All right. Hello, everybody. This is uh, going to be breakout room uh, B. Okay, so uh, if you can hear me, please put a check mark up. If you've already done this, uh, I apologize, but um, see who we got. Allison, would you mind uh, doing the uh, recording what we do again? Absolutely. Okay, great. Um, okay, so it looks like we've got a good uh, consensus of people. Okay, so let's start. Uh, this is a uh, school with a row of declining or dead arborvitae. So uh, let's uh, begin here. So this is in, this picture was taken in January 2013. Um, so what's happening to them? So again, raise your hand uh, if you'd like to talk or chat, and then uh, feel free to type in or speak. So where do we want to go from here? OK. OK, Danny. Um, just make sure to, uh, I guess you're going to be typing in. All right, Danny, if you want to type in your question or. Okay, uh, we're going to have to move it along. Um, Allison, you want to. Uh, when were they planted, the ones that are dead? When were they planted? Um, well, we're not so sure. The information wasn't provided, but we assume that all the trees, since this is a school, were probably planted in a row at the same time. Okay, Danny? You have a close-up. Close-up of what? Okay, so let's see. Um, so here's a close-up of one of the trees in decline. Um, and we can just uh, we can just look at this one too. So we've got a dead one next to a healthy, healthyish one. Uh, and then again, the close up of the trees. All right, um, so what do you see? Anything? Matt, can you hear me? Yes, you, uh, you're going to have to turn up your mic a little bit. It's, it's a little difficult to hear you. Okay, hang on a second. Is that better? Yes, yes. Okay, very good. Um, do you have um, a close-up of the the main trunk or stems? Okay. So let's see. Um, let's see. So here is a trunk of the declining tree. Um, this area is probably near the base, and a little further up, you see this. All right. So. Um, Anybody want to make an observation or ask anything else? Oh, uh, I do see some sap running or oozing on the picture that's on my right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, do um do we have any other images that might show us um what it looks like under the bark in that area? Okay. You um you want to look under the bark or some more images of the uh, trunk? I'm asking my group. Hang on. Both, they said. Okay. Well, let's look at the trunk again. Um, so let's see. So here's some more of the trunk. Okay. And what do we see? Does somebody else uh, want to 
chime in. We see how old is anybody else want to see what they forward? describe it there. Okay. So what next? Um, um do what we is, uh, somebody else want to try? Um, okay, I'll turn my mic off and let somebody else have a turn. Okay. So Peggy says insect damage boreholes. Okay, that's a good that's definitely a good uh observation. Okay, what else do you want to do then? Okay, so you had those trees. They had the declining foliage. Some of them were completely dead. You have resin oozing, and now you have these holes in the in the trunk. So what's somebody else? Um, okay, Patricia, uh, hold on a second. Please uh, uh, raise your hand before you type so I can uh, recognize you so we don't have all these uh, questions kind of firing out at the same time. Um, Okay, we'll go in order right now. Has the tree been treated for disease or pests? No, not as not as far as we know. Uh, just uh, have some drip irrigation. No, no pesticides being used. Okay, you want to check the soil around the trees. Okay, so um, so basically, what we're going to do then is look at kind of the uh, the roots. So we don't have a picture of the soil around the trees, around the base of the trees, but here's what was sent in. We're going to assume when we, when we saw these roots, the roots seemed fine and healthy. There was nothing abnormal about where the soil was, um, and the roots are healthy, appear to be healthy. All right, so um, what do we got? So uh, Danny, you want to ask another question for your group? And just make sure also after you recognize to just turn off the, the hand. Are um are there holes like that in all the the plants that have dieback? When okay, in that case we're not sure. Um there was only uh the obvious dead trees, the they were cut up and there were parts sent in. Um and uh, they they didn't notice the holes in anything else right away. Uh, and so, basically, all we have is uh, that one set of holes. Is there any further um, so, sections of the trunk, cross sections, or anything like that? Yes. That um, so let's see. Uh, well, let's go back to your previous question. Let's uh, let's look under the uh, trunk, under the bark. So, what do you see here? Anybody want to? Anybody see anything here? Okay, Durham. Either type in or use your mic. Okay, so is there fungal? Um, and uh it yeah, it looks like some decay here, but we're not sure. Now then we also um look under here. Okay. Well now we've uh looked under the bark a little bit more. And what do we see here? Okay, Danny. A larva of some type of beetle, I would assume. Okay. Um, all right. And uh, let's just pretend that you were really curious and you uh, you start peeling more and more. So here, here's what that section of tree looked like underneath after you peeled all the bark. And what do we see here? What does anybody observe? Tunnels. Okay, who, let's see, who is that? Allison. <laughs> okay, Allison, good. Uh, so, yeah, lots of tunneling, lots of tunnels, holes. So we have basically, that's that's basically what we're seeing in this, in this, in this whole sample. So we've got various trees in decline, 
Uh, you look closer at the trunk and see some damage and some holes. And then you start picking away the bark. And the, remember, this is a complete, one of the completely dead trees. You see this extensive tunneling. Uh, and I should note that this section right here is about 10 inches wide and about a foot long. So this is not a small part of the tree. This is not a, a branch. This is the main trunk with all these tunnels all around under it. So anything else that anybody wants to uh, ask? Uh, yes, Allison. I think Danny, did you want to say something first? Um, yes, I wanted to know whether any type of adult insects found and submitted. Uh, there were none. Uh, no, no adults. Uh, nothing, nothing on the trunk, and uh, there was no uh, awareness of what was underneath the trunk when it was submitted. Okay, Allison, would you like to ask a question? Well, we were just uh, interested in the original picture where you showed the lineup of the different trees, and the ones that were dead were much smaller. And um, my see. thinking, the, I think it was the, the that one, yeah. Yeah. Um, like, like there was some stressor early on uh, that didn't really get them off onto a good foot or get them established. Um, so I don't know, I mean, I'm always interested in that about plant health in relationship to infestation of boars as a response to stress. That's, that's a great observation. And yes, you're right, these are smaller, a little smaller. Uh, you can still see that there's a little bit of affected branches in some of these plants. Um, but a very good observation, and we will address that when we wrap up this this uh, breakout group uh, when we talk about a summary of what was happening. But I think everybody asked some great questions and, and looked, for, looked for some great uh, things. And uh, I think we're just about going to have everybody come back to the main room now um, in a few moments. But uh, really good observations. So our time was up for our breakout sessions, and we're all back in the main room, and um, Matt is going okay. to lead our discussion. Okay, so welcome back. Um, so uh, let's uh, go to the original slide. Okay, so let's discuss. Uh, anybody want to discuss what they, what they saw uh, or what the process was? I don't know if these hands... If you have hands up and you've already gotten your answers, your questions answered, uh, if you could click the raised hand button again just so um, we don't have the hands anymore. Okay, so somebody from one of the other groups maybe want to talk uh, since yeah. you were... Yes. Yeah, this is Carol. I was in group three, Matt. Okay, great. Yeah, some of our observations, uh, there were questions about the age, whether there had been a dry or wet season, how quickly the trees had declined. Uh, there were questions about the dead branches. Uh, had there been a soil test done? Was there any evidence of insects or holes in the base? And there were questions about the problem started, seeming to start low on the plant. There was also, in close observation, some looking at some oozing sap. We found some uh, exit insect holes in the trunk. There had been a little tumbling under the uh, bark when we peeled it back, and we found those clear insect trails. Uh, there was questions about brown specks and decay, and then we found some grub-like uh, insects under the bark. So the diagnosis from our group was that it was a cypress weevil. Okay. Uh, any other groups want to add uh, things that you, uh, different way you went about things, or anything else that you asked about?
Well, if not, let's uh, let's move on. So yes, so here's a summary of some of the slides you have seen. You saw some of the uh, uh, individual browning of some uh, stems and uh, some twigs. Also, you have completely dead trees next to healthy trees, and of course, one of the big signs was on the trunk of one of the declining trees, and uh, you have all these resin flows coming out that show some kind of stress or injury uh, to the tree. Um, and then most people, I think, I hope most groups kind of tried to look at the trunk more, and once they saw these exit holes, you really want to just kind of, especially if the tree is dead, um, open up the bark and see what's underneath. And of course, you saw these fairly obvious uh, insects, these grubs. Um, and so what was it? Uh, and as that group uh, very nicely found out, it was the cypress weevil, Eudeciminus manerheimii. So this is a very large weevil that uh, that bores into several cypress, groups of cypress, including Arvitae, uh, Leyland, uh, and some of the cryptomeria, some of the very most common landscape cypresses. Okay. Um, Mike, do you, is this time for you to take over now, or? Is there a control for that? Um, well, since, uh, since we're on it right now, um, I'll just quickly mention that uh, there are certain times of year you may want to spray, but the, we, what we know about the beetles is there's probably three generations a year, and the timing is very difficult. You can't control for the larvae once they're in there. Uh, the adults may be controlled by a topical insecticide, but you've got to get, gotta get the timing right. And also, um, I don't know, we'll, we should maybe wait until we talk about some of the procedures and concepts before I, I'll, I'll bring up uh, some other points to think about. Uh, this is Carol, and I have a question. We see a lot of this in Guilford County now. Is this something that is happening all over the county? You see it a lot. This weevil? Yeah, yeah the trees, the cypress trees, where you have this uh, browning and some dead and some live. So I'm wondering if it's just like an infestation or something that's just indicative to different counties that happening all over. It, it's a fairly common thing for these these landscape cypresses, and we actually uh, there are a number of causes for it, and some of them are not very well known the exact cause. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if Mike wants to chime in a little bit about uh, with this discussion, but um, basically. Uh, it's it's usually the primary cause is some kind of stress or some kind of uh, age-related issue, something like that, uh, which then affects uh, things later on down the line, basically. Okay. But we're not exactly sure what's going on uh, with some of these things. We get a lot of calls about these. And Mike, if he wants to chime in. Sure. The, let me see if I can go to a, uh, another page explorer is not opening. Um, let me navigate to one of the first pictures here that we had. When you see a symptom of decline on a conifer in the landscape, on one of these Leylands, Arborvitaes especially, there can be a lot of different causes, as Matt said, and you don't know just based on this view here, whether you're dealing with an insect, a disease, or something else, which is why we're talking about the whole diagnostic process and the questions that you would ask. All right, it is kind of on a berm. Has it been staying dry? I see someone noted about it or asked about when they were planted. So it's, there's not a one, one simple answer to what might be causing these symptoms. You look a little closer, you see some resin oozing out on the main stem. That is helpful, but there can be multiple things that can cause that too. We see it, for example, when arborvitaes have armillaria root rot that they will do that. Up on the trunk, they'll have some resin flow, but the problem is down in the roots and at the very base. So based on the fact that you're having browning out and even death of a lot of arborvitaes or Leylands in Guilford County does not mean that you necessarily have an infestation of that particular beetle. And Matt may uh, I want to talk later when we get into the section on IPM about primary and secondary pests. That's another consideration here. So you still have to keep your mind open as to what the cause is in any particular situation. There's also, we've 
found the cases, a lot of cases last year, I think it was, of an internal browning in Leylands where the foliage was drying up and we really couldn't find a disease or a pest to explain it. So we attribute it to some kind of physiological or environmental problem. Let me quickly comment too on the, the excellent observation about the size of the trees being different. Now one other explanation, you do want to certainly think about maybe those were under greater stress than the others. Maybe they were planted too deep, for example, in relation to the others. Maybe the soil is different in those locations. But always keep in mind the possibility that those are replacement trees, that something that was in the original planting of this row died and that these were substituted in their place or used to fill in gaps in the original planting. So again, there are a couple possible explanations for why those trees are smaller. Oh, Matt, um, I, when uh, Sean Banks came up with the cypress weevil as the diagnosis, I asked him what made him conclude that it was a cypress weevil and thought that you might uh, do that. Were you going to show your slide about uh, those two wood borer slides? I thought I had added those, but maybe they weren't in this portion. Oh, um, yeah, I actually didn't leave that in. Uh, the I was going to go into a whole thing about wood borers, but maybe that will be for a later date. But basically, um, weevils are legless, always legless completely, and have a very nice head capsule. So as you can see on, uh, let's see, um, right here. So you got this nice big head capsule, no legs, kind of grub-like. Uh, that is going to be a weevil. Um, so bark beetles are also going to look like that, but they're going to be much, much smaller. This this specimen here was uh, over a centimeter long. Um, bark beetles are going to be much, much smaller, but they are also weevils, so they would exhibit the same characteristics, no legs, and just a nice head right there. All right, then let's just, before we do go to the break, and we do realize it's been an intense hour here, uh, hour and, and uh, 20 almost, when you've got cases like this, sometimes it's not enough to sample just some branches looking for transition zones, some of the fine feeder roots that we use to test for Phytophthora along with the soil. Sometimes you have to actually have the very base of the main stem or the top of the root system, the largest roots. And obviously that's something that you want to think twice about before taking what we call a highly destructive sample. Again, it's necessary if we're going to confirm something like our malaria and certain wood boring insects, um, but you're going to want to do it only if the tree or shrub is dead, hopefully not long dead because then secondary things move in, or that it's gotten to the point where it's so unsightly that the, the landscape manager or the homeowner wants it removed. So the, about the bottom foot, 12 inches or so of the main stem and the top of the root system is what we would want in those cases. In some situations, you'll be able to see some bark that's peeling off and break it off even while it's still standing. And you'd be looking for the telltale signs of either insects, as we had in the last example, or this mat of whitish to creamish fungal mycelium, in this particular case, indicating our malaria root rot. And here's another case where you actually would find the culprit by splitting. This is um, it's kind of hard to visualize here, but these are the two halves of a stump that was split. So this is one half. Here's the cut end of the top surface. So to the extreme right and the extreme left are where the soil would have been. And here, burrowing down below the soil line or close to it, you would find a larva. This one, Matt, was this the peach tree borer, yes. lesser peach tree borer? Yes, it was a peach tree borer. Especially that low near the ground, it's probably it's a lesser peach, I mean a peach tree borer. So with that, a well-deserved break. While you're on break, we're going to force a couple of PDF files on you to uh, help with your interactions with clients on Woody Ornamentals and also as a little summary of some of the points that we're going to talk to about IPM. How much time are we going to take here, Lucy? Uh, it is 11.20. Do you want to 
say 11, 1125 or you or do you want less than that? I wouldn't take more than five minutes. Sounds good. Five minutes. Okay. See you back here at 1125. So you should have a, a thing pop up that says that, that Michael J. Munster has sent you a key questions for Woody's PDF. Do you wish to save it? Please save that because we're going to use that and we'll be talking about that later in the program. So when you, when you say yes, it'll give you uh, the opportunity to decide where you want to download it. And once you download it, then if you would open it, that would be great. They're on break, Lucy. They didn't hear that. Good point.
All right, welcome back. We're Mike, we're ready for you. So we're skipping the showstoppers? Um, Mark is here to do showstoppers, but the slides are somewhere different. So sh should we oh. skip to where those are? or? I thought I had them all in the right place. This, yeah, is, this is actually one of, of Mark's pictures. Mark, are you here that you would be willing to, to talk about? Welcome. I am. I'm on. Sorry we don't have your lead-in slide. Hey, here you so go. <laughs> oh, wow. Great. Okay, so no slides. Uh, I'll just talk about uh, it. And we'll see we're later. looking right now at uh, an image of the oh, wow. uh, big tub with, with beautiful sweet potato vines and other things, begonias oh. and stuff. Ooh. Okay, so, well, thanks a lot, everybody. Really appreciate that. We'll do some showstopper plant stuff real quick. These are NCSU introductions that we'll be highlighting this year. So for the Sweet Potato Sweet Caroline series, all in typical fashion, Sweet Caroline, Sweet <laughs> Potatoes, Iponia Batatas. So good, so good, so good. All right, so these are great plants that you can fill in the containers, put into ornamental settings, anywhere you want. They're really great. And so NC State has come up with a, a series of them. Sweet Caroline, those are a little more practical, a little more compact than some of the other sweet potato ornamental varieties that we've had in the past, which do really good with tire pruning when they're near driveways and, and roadways and such. These are much more compact, so check out those. The next slide will show you another container where we have spillers, we have fillers, we have thrillers. Oh, what a great deal that's there and some foliage on the next slide, and tips for success on that last one. Hey, remember, they're tropical, so uh, not going to do so well with freezing temperatures. Remember that. The more sun, the better. They're going to have brighter colors, more foliage, bigger runners, just a more full plant, the more sun they get. Give them some room to grow. Even these Sweet Caroline series that are more compact, uh, give them a little bit of space. They'll do better down the road. And remember the potato part. So uh, sweet potato is in their name. These guys can get sweet potatoes the size of footballs underground. So watch out for small containers. They could uh, easily pop right out of those things if given enough time to grow the potato part. There's a really good PDF of a, a horticultural fact sheet on these guys. Print those out for your master gardeners or your family to take home to look at it. Consider these great plants. They're wonderful, and so are you. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thank you, Mark Blevins. Really appreciate you um, seeing the section on, on NC plant introductions. Yeah, it's a beautiful day here in Ocracoke. I bet. Bye, everybody. Oh, I was helping and not helping. Okay. All right. Uh, can everyone hear me? Give me a quick green check to make sure at least that one person can hear me. If at least one person can hear, then I will continue. All right. We threw you into the deep end with our breakout sessions and having you work through some of these scenarios and then through your lifeline to try and talk through what the diagnostic process is with these. But now we're going to take just a few seconds to give an overview of the general concepts as how what they had to do with problems in woody ornamentals. And then we're going to talk about IPM and how we go about preventing and managing the problems when they do occur. So first of all, some of the things that we look for when woody plants have problems. One would be any kind of change in the leaf color. It could be a yellowing or orange color of the leaves or turning brown, which may actually start as blotches or on the margins before it affects the entire leaf. Leaf drop falling off of the plant, especially on the lower branches. Leaves that are smaller than normal. Twig and branch dieback we saw in the azalea example. And then 
for yearly growth increment, we didn't talk about this, but if you look and see that it had been growing well for several years and that the last year or two of growth was much shorter, then there's an indication that something had changed within that period of time. Also, some people think that lichens on branches are a pest, but really what they are is indication that something else is happening and weakening that particular tree or shrub. Whole plant problems, we may see foliage discoloration beginning at the tips, but not usually isolated individual branches, or the entire plant turns brown and dies. So then you know that you've got something uh, either down lower in the main trunk or more likely down in the roots or in the soil. When it comes to wilting, in fact, and dieback, there are a whole number of things that you need to keep in mind. Poor planting or poor care that leads to water stress. It could be that they're not getting enough water. It could be that the soil or the potting mix is hydrophobic and water is not able to penetrate. It could be that there was excess fertilizer applied or this year some salts from road or sidewalk de-icing that have gotten into the soil and are causing plant stress or just the fact that it was planted too deep when that happened or planted at the wrong season. Fungal root rot is a very common cause of wilting or dieback and root feeding nematodes can build up over time and cause that same kind of stress. Growth reduction is especially common. Canker diseases we saw where you would see them isolated on particular branches and a sharp transition zone between the dead and healthy tissue. Vascular wilt disease where the plumbing of the plant is actually clogged up and you get sudden wilting of individual branches or entire plants. And then insects, borers that we talked about in our breakout B and rodents. Don't forget to look for the possibility of vole damage in the root system. My particular way of looking at diseases on woody plants is to put them on this scale from least to most serious. Now some people may quibble with this, but just as a general principle, you might want to jot these down, that the least serious are our leaf spot diseases. Oftentimes, especially on our deciduous trees, they're going to lose their leaves anyway at the end of the year. They're basically a cosmetic problem. So powdery mildew and leaf spots would be the least serious. Then more serious, we would have our canker diseases. And we already saw an example of those in the azalea uh, scenario. Of course, there are exceptions. The terrible chestnut blight disease was a canker disease and practically wiped out the chestnut east of the Rockies. And of course, leaf spots, uh, boxwood blight is essentially a leaf spot and a very serious one. So there are exceptions to this pattern. Root rots would be our next more serious issue to deal with in woody plants because they affect the entire plant. And then finally, the vascular wilts. Again, that's when the, the xylem, the plumbing of the plant gets clogged up and the entire tree or shrub irreversibly wilts. You should have already received an invitation, a suggestion to download a couple of PDF files. And we won't go through this first one, but please do save and look over the file called Key Questions for Woody. That is a summary of some of the things that you'll want to ask when you're dealing with a client who's got tree or shrub problems. Most of these actually already came up in the process of working through our scenarios. The second file that was offered for your download is called IPM Concepts Practices. And that is one we want to spend just a little bit of time now in this last, last 26 minutes of the program. And let me, since the concepts part was more Matt's than mine, I'm going to let him take over and talk a little bit about that. Hopefully you've all had a chance to open that file and see this is a one page summary of some bullet points relating to concepts in integrated pest management and some practices for the home landscape. <coughs> OK. So Matt. Um, all right, so uh, are we going based on the f file? Uh, what's, uh, what's listed in the file, or are we going straight into these slides? The, the file, I think they can just have that open as a, as a reference to see the, 
the whole list and that you can talk about the individual concepts and practice or concepts would be the things that you'll want to talk about. Um, although that's a good point since the slide set is it's it's missing, very, uh, I think we're missing our bullet points for the concepts. Um, they are. They are missing. Just yeah, we're have slides to and the, the handout will be a, a backup tool we can use later. Yeah, that was my fault. Um, do you want to try to add that slide right now real quick? Or should we just uh, um, assume that everybody's going to read the file we sent uh, with all the concepts? I don't have it in front of me. That's the only issue. It didn't get offered to you too when <laughs> it did, but I have it on my other computer, so I didn't download it. <laughs> if you'd like to offer it again, I will download it, and we can look at that. Um. All right. For those who didn't get it the first time around. Okay, let's see if it's going to save it. Um, Let me ask the backwards question. Is there anyone who was not able to get that file and open it? If you could give a red X. For some reason, I cannot find it downloaded. Um, it did not seem to download. Um, All right, we have two okay. people who... Yeah, can you send that one more time? Just to make sure I'm down, saving it in the right place. Oh, there, can there we go. Nice. Okay. Well, uh, thank you. To the rescue. Okay. <laughs> okay, great. Well, let's uh, let's go over from here then. Uh, so some concepts. So first, and this is why diagnosis is so important. Know your pest or pathogen. This unlocks so much information, like uh, the life cycle, reproduction, spread, uh, various things about its biology. So that's why. Uh, the clinic is such an important resource and why knowing what you're looking at is very important. Okay. All righty. Um, next, um, whether the, figure out for some whether the pests are primary or other or secondary. So this is going to be a big thing. So actually in our second scenario, were the beetles primary or secondary? Well, in general, a lot of these wood boring beetles are secondary, so there's probably some stressor that is affecting the trees. Uh, also, and that goes into our next thing, reducing stress reduces disease and insect problems overall. So first, take care of the plants, take care of all the environmental uh, things that lead to a healthy plant. Um, for insects, knowing what life stage is present and what does the damage is important, um, and you'll see that in a second. Uh, also, know the damage potential and whether control efforts are warranted. So sometimes it's just aesthetic, so you don't really want to pour a bunch of chemicals on the plant uh, just to treat it, and it may not even be possible. So it's basically what your level of uh, comfort is. Investigate cultural and chemical control strategies. Cultural control strategies are easy to do at home by yourself. Um, chemical control strategies change often, um, so you should really reference the most current literature. Uh, also, figure out the timing of control when that's important. And then uh, lastly, um, I'll just go to the next slides. Uh, so let's, let's just, uh, oh. sorry, what's going on here? Is everybody following me? I don't know what's going on here. Um, okay, does everybody on this uh, page know what life stage is present? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, so,
For instance, uh, knowing what's the life stage of an insect, this is an imported willow leaf beetle. These, both the adults and larvae, are causing damage. So if you see one, you know that you've got a control. On the other hand, uh, you've got fall canker worms, where the adults don't do any damage, uh, and the larvae are doing the damage. But in this case, it's interesting where you want to control when you see the adults that aren't doing the damage uh, versus the larvae, which are a little bit more difficult to control. So knowing what life stage, say you have an adult of a species that's not, uh, you, that's not doing any direct da damage, you may then look out for the larvae later on. Uh, and then also, if using chemical control, be aware of non-target effects. So if you treat this plant with a systemic insecticide, is it going to go into the flowers and the pollen? Is that going to affect bees? Uh, is it going to affect uh, predators? Uh, of those insects. So knowing that uh, is going to help you uh, save a lot of time and headache. Okay, uh, so Mike, I think it's now for you. Okay. I don't have the list. You can have the handout there as a reference. Pretty much I'm going to follow point by point down these ideas of, well not ideas anymore, not concepts, but practices of things that we can do for integrated pest management in the home landscape, especially for woody ornamentals, but these things will apply across the board. The first is to choose plants that are adapted to your climate and soil and that are resistant to the prevailing pests. So this picture was taken from where uh, actually uh, close to where I worked in the last place that we lived in Mexico. So our soils and climate are very much different from deserts, yet some people want to plant agaves and things here. So you're better off trying to find things that are going to fit in, in this area. Another example of that, not at the species level, choosing the right kind of plant, but choosing the right varieties. You notice a big difference in these Indian hawthorns, some lush and green, others stunted and with a lot of leaf spots. And the difference here being two different varieties, one of which, at least the key difference here to point out, is that it is much more susceptible to entomosporium leaf spot. Actually, this picture was taken a couple of years ago, and by now that middle shrub is all eliminated, and the other two on the sides are growing in. Don't overuse species or cultivars. Everyone has got a red maple, practically. There are a lot of uh, crepe myrtles out there. There are a lot of just about you name it. And this is a recipe for problems later down the road if we don't have enough variety and something comes in to wipe everything out. It seems like every generation has to learn that lesson for itself. When I was younger, it was the whole Dutch elm disease scenario that, that played out. But this would be the way that we want to, to approach it when you've got the opportunity to get in on the ground level and talk to people about what to install. Oftentimes you're dealing with situations that the die has already been cast and the plants are, are established. Third point, inspect plants before buying. This is a sample that came in from a nursery actually and you'll notice that in some of them the root system is in pretty tremendous condition. So don't just look at what the top looks like. Obviously, if they're stunting, if there's yellowing, you want to be suspicious. But what do the roots look like? And I even have a terrible personal experience with this where, well, let's just say I uh, felt a certain urgency about planting a gardenia that we had bought, and it was a mistake because it had root, not nematodes. Most of the time, you don't have nematodes when you buy containerized plants, but that can happen with gardenia, and so I spent some uh, some time and effort trying to make sure that that didn't get out into our landscape and into our garden. Again, look at the roots. Sometimes looking at the roots will let you know that you had a plant that was quite pot-bound before, and obviously is going to struggle going into the landscape. Turns out that with boxwood blight now, this is really critical because when Whenever we see boxwood blight getting in and causing trouble in established boxwood plantings, it's because a new plant, uh, this dealing with homeowner situations, I think they've all been cases where new plants have been recently brought in and that those plants had brought the fungus. This fungus spreads by water splash and is 
uh, quite easily transmitted from one new plant that came in infected to the established ones. Fourth point of IPM for woody ornamentals is to raise your beds and improve your soil. So here's a, an example of a, a raised bed nicely mulched next to a, a lawn area. And, oh, I'm sorry. Um, get back to that point in a moment. Here's a case, I have a better, oh, I know I didn't use my better picture because it wasn't woody. Here's a, here's a classic situation of some burfer hollies, which are pretty much bulletproof when it comes to pests and diseases, but because of the drainage here, the soil is waterlogged in part of the landscape next to this building, and that's the reason the plants there were not thriving, probably having something to do with this downspout. Some pictures that I inherited from Dr. Mike Benson and his research with Phytophthora root rot are really, really striking in what kind of difference it makes, how you actually present your bed or, or prepare your bed. So here's a case where they put Phytophthora in with the azaleas in a bed that was at the same level as the surrounding landscape. And after, I forget the time period, it was around a two-year time frame, between two and three years, I think, they had a high mortality rate in the azaleas because of the Phytophthora. But if they raised the level above the surrounding grade, it made a tremendous difference. And even more, if you in integrated pine bark in as an organic amendment to the soil, so here's a case, at the front it says inoculated. These are plants where they were actually inoculated or given Phytophthora in the soil, and still they look fine during the period of the experiment. So what you can do to prepare that bed is uh, a big difference in terms of root diseases. Now while we're talking about mulch, because I don't think I have a slide just about mulching, but it can, very, it can be a very good practice um, Oh wait, I do, have a, I do have a slide about that, so let me hold off on that. Horticulture information leaflet 8601 from Irv Evans is something that you can use as a reference to make sure that you are doing the proper thing when you're planting. How to correctly plant our woody trees and shrubs. And part of that, of course, is planting it in the correct season when they have a good chance of being able to establish. Sometimes the problem is things that we do as gardeners, as landscapers. So we need injury and also poor planting were evident on these small trees that came into the clinic a few years ago. The roots are turned upward because the plants were stuck into a hole that was too narrow. Here's my slide on mulch correctly. Uh, I'm not the uh, best person to give a mulch lecture, but we do want to avoid volcanoes and leave some open ground around the base of the tree. And the picture on the left here is actually to illustrate a point about the, going all the way back to the beginning of today's program with Camellia petal blight. These little cup-like, almost mushroom-like structures are the fruiting bodies of the Siberinia camellia and they are growing out of the hard fungal sclerotia that survived all the way through the summer and then the winter on the surface of the soil. And it's spores that are produced here that will be carried by wind currents to the newly opening blossoms in the spring. One way to avoid this is to rake up and remove those fallen blossoms. But if that didn't happen, come in with a layer of mulch in the late winter so that this never see the light of day. Mention again that optimizing your fertilization and watering schemes, not too much, not too little, find that Goldilocks point, will help you in preventing disease and insect problems. Obviously avoid unnecessary injury. This poor tree was in our neighborhood and uh, a fairly brutal job of pruning was done on it. Practicing pruning includes sanitation pruning. So removing those 
cankered branches or removing things like here's a nice picture of exobacidium leaf gall on camellia, cutting those out before they have a chance to spoilate, and cleaning your pruning shears or knives frequently during the process. I've shown here how a little chip of wood can sometimes be carried over on those shears. Fire blight would be another type of disease where you would want to be using the pruning shear to get ahead of it if the tree is not too large. And in rare cases, pesticides may be useful or almost necessary in the landscape, but we tend to try and emphasize in integrated pest management all these cultural practices first and then get ahead of the disease problem, prevent rather than trying to cure. Some of the cases where it may be warranted to use a fungicide would be entomosporium leaf spot, possibly, if you've got an Eden hawthorn that's susceptible, but something that you still want to try and hang on to. Black spot of rose and Cercospora leaf spot as well, classic if you've got a rose variety that is susceptible. And in some cases where there's a lot of damage, on the Kothui, for example, you may need some fungicide applications against powdery mildews. Then in most cases, we try and avoid this with our woody ornamentals. Let me mention, too, the timing that Matt had put on the concepts list is very important. If you see spot anthracnose on the dogwood, it should be coming soon. You're too late to do anything about it for th this year. If you see the, um, likewise, the exobacidium leaf gall, and you missed the window of opportunity for this year. So knowing and understanding the timing, the phenology of your pest is important. I can't emphasize enough the idea that it is generally, and actually I would say in almost all cases, neither economically nor ecologically justifiable to try and use fungicides against root rots. And I put this picture in to emphasize here the hand, to emphasize the large root system that our woody ornamentals have. So trying to keep that much of a root system, that much of a volume of soil treated with a concentration of fungicide that is only going to suppress and not kill the fungi that are present is just not worth it. Likewise, they're not likely to be effective against cankers. This is ceridium canker here on Leyland. And I believe I mentioned this before. Weigh the costs. I'll let Matt weigh in on this one. OK. Um, <clears throat> let's see. I'm not sure. OK. Um, so pesticide uh, applications, when you want to do that. Um, I'm not sure what examples I was going to talk about, but um, some insects examples, so in woody ornamentals, later in the season, in about August or so, you're going to have things like uh, um, striped oak worms coming out. Now they're going to be creating a lot of mess with their frass coming down. They're going to make some of the branches look bad on these oaks, but the problem is that it's going to be very difficult to treat them Treating them is not going to do much because they're going to eat fairly quickly. And they only affect leaves, not the whole entire tree. Uh, and they only affect the leaves in the later end of the season and only on the isolated branches. So in that case, if you can put up with the frass and these caterpillars wandering around and getting run over on the driveway, don't worry about it. Just don't uh, apply pesticides. It's not going to help much. Uh, and really, it's just an aesthetic thing. Um, other examples are going to be um, uh, boring insects. Uh, these, although they are very detrimental to the plants in some cases, are almost impossible to control with chemicals. They are they are going to be living under the in the tissue. Uh, they're going to be very difficult to actually control. So then you want to basically figure out the timing of when the adults are coming out and laying eggs uh, and getting that timing right to control them. But otherwise, once you have the issue, it's kind of a wait and see game. And, and hopefully the plant will survive fine uh, with a little bit of damage. Um, 
as far as um, MITE examples, sometimes treating for one pest can actually create uh, situations that are good for other pests. Uh, where you spray for one type of insect uh, and this actually causes explosions in, say, mite populations, for instance. So is it worth spraying, then, if you're going to create a, a good situation uh, that will uh, benefit another pest that may actually be worse? Uh, so basically, you got to know your situation, you got to know your pest, uh, and you got to have, figure out what your threshold is for is it, is it necessary to control these, or can I live with it? Um, uh, and uh, when I, we talk about the be on the lookouts, I'll talk about another example. And I think mine is first. So for February through April, of course, we were going to do this last month, but the snow kept us from doing it. But these are still valid. So the one thing that are going to be the fall canker worms. Uh, the fall canker worms should be coming out very soon. Uh, the leaves are coming out on a lot of these plants, uh, and they like these new tender leaves uh, coming out in the spring. Should you apply pesticides? If you can time it right and you have this small tree that's very valuable to you and you like the foliage, then maybe it's all right. If not, if it's a large tree, the tree will be able to grow leaves again, will be able to survive, and they won't create permanent damage. So again, you've got to weigh your, your options. Uh, also, this time of year, you're going to see a lot of the boxwood pests. Boxwood mites will be present, but you probably won't see the damage until later in the season when they're gone. Uh, the psyllids and the leaf miners will be out. Um, if you can time it right and find the adults of the boxwood leaf miners, great. You can use a chemical control to try and get the adults uh, while they land on the plant. Otherwise, it's going to be uh, a long wait uh, to see what happens to the plant. And usually, these are mostly aesthetic anyway. Uh, lace bugs are going to start coming out uh, at this time of year, uh, laying their eggs and, and rearing their young. Um, again, spray might be necessary. Tank caterpillars are usually, they're going to defoliate a little bit, but again, like many of the caterpillars, they're going to be out for only a short period of time. Uh, if you don't catch it in time, the plants, especially these large trees, are going to survive fine with some damage to the leaves. Uh, important the willow leaf beetles, if you catch them early enough in the larval stage, you might be able to spray for them. Uh, and that's actually maybe better because the adults will come out from those larvae and also feed on the plants. And of course, there are going to be many other things coming out at this time of year. Everything's warming up, so the insects are very happy. Okay, Mike? Mike, yeah, you might need to click your mic. <laughs> oh, I am Mike. Oh, the other mic. Yes, uh, sorry. A lot of these things are diseases that we've already talked about and disorders in the course of today's program. But just to recap, cold injury, we'll be looking for that, especially after the winter that we had. Entomosporium leaf spot on Indian hawthorn and on photinia. Exobacidium leaf gall, here's a we know what it looks like on Camellia. I showed a picture of that before. Here's an example of what it looks like on Azalea. We can get on Azalea and Rhododendron as well as Camellia. Phytophthora and Armillaria root rots. We talked about what symptoms you would get when you've got a root rot in terms of the general decline of the plants before death. Our Gymnosporangium rust will be showing up on their juniper host. So quince rust that may have passed by now. Uh, it may still be in some places coming out. And of course, our cedar apple rust will be showing up. Later in the summer, we'll start seeing it on the apples, crab apples, and other rosaceous hosts. Although we will start seeing our fire blight in terms of, I um, mean, on our uh, pear and apple during the spring. Boxwood blight, we need to always keep a lookout for that. You can see some of our previous programs for explanations of boxwood blight and also the things that we have online. Pottery and mildew will be showing up. Most cases, it's not something that you need to be concerned about or the homeowner either. Likewise, with the leaf spots and anthracnoses on maple and spot anthracnose on dogwood illustrated in the lower left. Of course, people are not just growing woody ornamentals. Uh, the fact that we talked about them doesn't mean that there are not going to be other problems in the landscape for the next couple of months. But the vegetable gardens should be pretty clean as things get cranked up and maybe a few still uh, lingering problems with sclerotinia semrot and cooler weather on things like the brassicas. 
but we want to emphasize, of course, the use of quality transplants for those who don't grow from their own seed to make sure that the garden gets off to a good start. In the flower beds, might be still some detritus blight, and uh, we'll start seeing our septoria leaf spot on black-eyed Susan and hollyhock rust. Both of those are illustrated there on the right, as well as powdery mildew on Gerbera. In turf, winter injury will be something to look for, spring dead spot, as the name implies, and fairy ring just about any time of the year. And with that, I will turn it back in over to its uh, 1201, turn it back over to Lucy for the final sign-off. Lucy, you may have made my mistake about not turning your microphone on. Right, I'm just chatting away. Thanks for, for letting me know. Okay, so thank you guys for joining us this morning. Looking forward to hearing your comments on um, ways to Im improve our breakout room strategy for having you more engaged in the process of learning diagnostic skills. Our next uh, session will be on Tuesday, April 28th at 10 o'clock, and we'll look forward to seeing you there. We're going to end the, the program formally, um, but we'll show a couple of announcements after the, the music. Okay, thanks for joining us. I want to just um, flip through a couple of notices and uh, information so that they'll be on our recording for those who missed the, the formal program. These are generally shown in the half hour before the, the program starts. We flip through these slides to give you some background information and inspire you to get logged in early so we're ready to go right on time. Uh, an update on the, the uh, Extension Gardener Manual. We are very close to launching the compost chapter, and the integrated pest management and propagation are, are right behind them. So uh, we're moving forward. If any of you are interested in volunteering to help, you can contact Kathleen Moore. And she's got lots of different opportunities and ways that you can get engaged. Wanted to remind you that the gardening.ces.ncsu.edu is the landing place or the jumping off spot, I would say, for, for consumer horticulture information at NC State. Uh, so please share that with folks that you're working with and, and let me know what else needs to be there. We have a listserv that goes out to Extension Master Gardener volunteers and you can sign up by going to go.ncsu.edu, subscribe, hyphen EMGV, hyphen listserv. And that will, will put you in where you'll get the last minute update if the, of the website address for, the, for logging into the um, PowerPoint program with Collaborate and whatever else news goes out to Extension Master Gardeners around the state. Um, there's information about plants, pests, and pathogens both on our public website. It tells you about the content and the program and then the logins are on our, our password protected intranet for Extension Master Gardener volunteers. We have a new publication out on how to use the North Carolina Extension Master Gardener name and emblem appropriately, and it's got lots of, of images to show you what is acceptable and what's not acceptable. Working hard to have a consistent, clear brand image for the Extension Master Gardener in, program in North Carolina. Need everybody to use the same logo in the same way so that uh, we're recognized as a cohesive whole. Uh, the, License plates are out. You can order them online. You do not have to be an Extension Master Gardener to order a license plate. We're looking at them as an incredible opportunity to promote the program as well as to raise funds for the endowment. Uh, there's a, you know, if you want to go to the website, it's just go.ncsu.edu forward slash EMGV hyphen tag. So <clears throat> you can order the plate right there online, or you can also um, download a print form so that you can, can order and send, send in the, the information printed. Thanks for helping to promote this with your, your 
Master Gardener program in your county and with your new students in your class. If you have other ideas about ways to promote the license plate, we're all ears. This is the Extension Master Gardener Endowment Group and the Master Gardener Association are both working to, to support the license plates. Got some new additions to ncsugarden.com, which is our Master Gardener intranet. We have a new section that's called My Calendar that uh, allows you to keep track of what you volunteered to, to, um, to help with. You click on that My Calendar button and, and uh, it pulls up just your specific information. We have a new search engine so you can type and find stuff, uh, have it searched within your, your site. And we have the capacity to add information now in a table format so you can structure the, the information. <clears throat> the North Carolina Extension Master Gardener Volunteer Conference uh, for 2015 is going to be September 21st to the 22nd. It will be in Embassy Suites at the Raleigh, in Raleigh-Durham. And it will be followed immediately by the Extension Agent training on the 22nd and 23rd. <clears throat> We are taking a, a group of Master Gardeners to Costa Rica in February of 2016. There's lots of information online um, and I encourage you to go to go.ncsu.edu forward slash Costa hyphen Rica. For that, there's also information in, at the statewide section of ncsugarden.com under advanced training. And here's a list of, of things to put on your calendar. The National Extension Conference on Volunteerism is going to be in Portland, Maine, May 5th through the 7th. Native Plant Conference is July 15th through the 18th. The North Carolina Master Gardener Conference is the 20, September 21st and 22nd. And the International Master Gardener Conference is September 22nd to the 25th in Council Bluffs, Iowa. Incredible opportunity to connect with people from certainly all over the country and Canada and Korea and other places where they have Extension Master Gardener programs, lots of outstanding speakers and, and fun opportunities. All of these are on the calendar at the ncsugarden.com so you can get more detailed information. I believe that that's all of our announcements. So thank you again for, for joining us and we'll see you next time. <laughs>